Oh my kyana timiranda sya gyananjana shalaka ya chakshur on milta miena tasmaya shri guru vena maha. Nama om vishnu padaya krishna prasaya bhutale shri mati bhakti viranta swami nitinamine. Namaste saraswati devi gauravani pracharine nirvishesha sunyavadi pasatya deshitarine. Jai shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nitinanda shri advaita gathadara shiva sari gaura bhakti vrinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So thank you all for coming to this class on the glories of Yamuna Devi. Um, I have to say that I actually am embarrassed that I didn't really delve into the glories and pastimes of Yamuna Devi before being asked to, to give this class. And so, so therefore, Please forgive me for my shortcomings and for um, speaking, even though I know that so many here know more about Yamuna Devi than I do. But also please give me your blessings um, to say something of value. And um, I'm, I, I feel like I'm doing this mostly for my own purification and it's been the best to, to read about Yamuna Devi and learn more and more about her. Um, the glories of Yamuna Devi are unfathomable. unfathomable. Um, just like as the glories of Krishna and the glories of Srila Prabhupada are unlimited. So there's no way to speak about Yamuna Devi without speaking about Srila Prabhupada and Krishna who is so dear to her. And therefore her glories are also unlimited. So I'm just going to speak about a few um, qualities of hers that I've been meditating on and learning about. Um, so, um, there's a book on Yamuna Devi. There's a book on Yamuna Devi called Unalloyed, A Life of Devotion. And it's the perfect title for this book because the meaning of unalloyed, as Radhanath Swami said, is love is pure, untainted by any trace of egoism or selfishness. The realm of consciousness where every thought, word, and deed is an offering for the pleasure of one's beloved. This is the story of Yamuna Devi's life. Um, it's the perfect way to describe her because every fiber of her being was purely dedicated to the service of Guru and Krishna. There was no selfishness at all. There was nothing in it for herself. Um, Radhanath Swami spoke about how at the end of her life, when she was at Bhaktivedanta Hospital, she wrote to him, uh, well, she would call him and say, and this is what Radhanath Swami remembers, Yamuna would call me regularly from the Bhaktivedanta Hospital and say, I am leaving this place. She was still in critical condition. I said, why are you leaving this place? She said, because too many people are serving me. I don't like to be served. I like to do things myself. But if you leave, you will die. Better to die than to accept so much service. This was her nature. I said, don't you understand? Please understand. They see Srila Prabhupada in you more than they have ever seen him before in anyone. By your accepting their service, you are connecting them with Srila Prabhupada. You are doing the greatest service to them. She said, really? I said, definitely. You can ask anyone. So she said, all right then, then to serve them, I will stay. So this, is, this was her nature. And we know Yamuna Devi as being um, one of Srila Prabhupada's closest and most dear disciples because of this unalloyed nature of hers to just serve and not think of anything for herself. Um, Mother Kulangana from the Bhaktivedanta Manor, um, I don't know if anyone remembers those famous Bhaktivedanta Manor Mangal sweets that Mother Kulangana made. And they're very creatively done, very beautiful. Um, she also remembers Yamuna Devi very fondly. She says that Yamuna Devi was non-envious, very selfless, always glorifying devotees and putting them forward and keeping herself in the background. And something very interesting she said was that Yamuna Devi treated everyone as a person. So there was no trace of impersonalism in her. She was always very personal, very caring, and always inquiring about devotees, whoever she spoke to, and um, would genuinely be interested. She was always deeply attentive to everyone and every service, and was very um, present in the moment with, 
with the devotees and she never criticized devotees. Um, she was a perfectionist in all of her services. Um, every service for Yamuna Devi was a deep meditation for her. It wasn't like the way, at least for me, the way I see service to get a task done and then move on to the next task. For Yamuna Devi it was, she was deeply absorbed in every single service she did. did. So her whole day, 24 hours, was just one state of absorption to, to the next. And she was expert in all fine arts. Um, we know, in terms of cooking, we know Yamuna Devi for her very famous cookbook, Lord Krishna's Cuisine, The Art of Indian Vegetarian Cooking, which actually won multiple awards, um, including the International Association of Culinary Professionals Cookbook of the Year. So this is an award-winning cookbook in the like secular world, not in just devotional circles. So everyone could recognize the, the importance of this book, and the value of this book. And she also served as Srila Prabhupada's personal cook for eight years. But the story of how she learned cooking is so interesting. It was from the first day when she came to the temple, she was engaged in cooking. Um, so many of you may know the story of how she came, but her sister, Janaki, was getting married to Mukunda. And she didn't know anything about what they were doing. She just know, knew there was a wedding happening and they were coming to be, and they were going to get married and a Swami was performing the ceremony. So she came to attend the wedding and Srila Prabhupada asked, who else is coming from the family? Because in Indian culture, it's it's customary for the whole family to make a very big deal about a wedding. And she said, she's the only one coming. So then he said, oh, now, you know, can you help me cook? So she did. And she said that he prepared 14 offerings, 14 different preparations for the wedding. And she just made one. And it was a very complicated preparation. And in that experience, she was learning all about cooking and devotional cooking. Um, she kept... Uh, you know, wiping her face or wanting to drink water or um, wanting to have a cigarette because that's what they used to do back then. And Srila Prabhupada would just say, wash your hands after each one. So she was, he was training already that um, cooking, one has to be very clean in cooking. Cooking is not for us to taste first, it's to offer to Krishna and only the best for Krishna. So she learned all of this in that first um, experience. And then well, fast forward a few years and cooking became one of her most important services. Um, Vishaka Devi, the president of Bhaktivedanta Manor and the very famous um, devotee who, who made the Hare Krishna movie, so we all know Vishaka Devi, she recalls about Yamuna Devi. Cooking was her constant meditation. She would shop for, clean and cut the boga, pick out foreign particles from the dals, rice and spices. Soak and marinate, make chances and fresh pastes, and consistently clean the utensils, kitchen, and eating areas. The loving intensity of her absorption was a wonder to behold, and sampling the preparations she made, one could only think they'd descended directly from Goloka. She, Yamuna Devi would meditate for hours before she cooked, and everything was first class. Um, Janavi Harrison, the famous singer, has written a beautiful poem about this point of Yamuna Devi's uh, absorption in cooking and her perfectionism and also in every service. I think we all know Janavi from her amazing music. <laughs> um, so she wrote this poem called No Stems. I chopped coriander on the table and you glanced over. No stems, you said, so seriously. I wondered if you meant it. You did. No stems, you repeated. So I dutifully picked every fragrant leaf off the bunch. Today and ever since, I do the same. And with the familiar scent, your face and voice appear. I pick in the hope of one day living in your world. No stems, only the finest for your dear most. To some, it is pedantic, over fastidious. Just chop them up and throw them in, cries the world. But I cry for this. No stems, for hours spent in selfless service, for showers in ice water on winter mornings, for ridicule endured, for perfectly drawn lines, for soft, subtle, sweet, silent love. No stems for your beloved, as cried the gopis. 
The stones of Raja will bruise his lotus feet. You pick leaf after leaf, a subtle alchemy, transformation at the greatest depth. So Jana V. Harrison, uh, we know that she spent a lot of time with Yamuna Devi in her life. And she has many, many beautiful memories and stories of their interactions. And this was a poem she wrote based on what she had observed and experienced from Yamuna Devi. And Yamuna Devi had a fine sensory perception, which she learned from Srila Prabhupada, who could also always know exactly how a preparation was made and um, how to perfect preparations. There's one pastime where Yamuna Devi wanted to make a Vrajbasi chapati for, for Srila Prabhupada. And she asked the locals, how do you make it? And they told her to get a specific wheat and it has to be milled manually and um, cooked on a specific neem wood. And she actually did all of this and made it for Srila Prabhupada. And she writes in her journal the response. With the first bite of the chapati, he noted, You have done everything right. It is Pishi Lahore wheat, milled yesterday, and the neem wood gives it a special distinctive flavor. One thing though, it should cook for one or two seconds more on the griddle. Then it will be perfect. I was stunned by his perceptive critique. As in all things, Srila Prabhupada was truly a connoisseur of foods, wanting us to learn how to prepare and offer the best of everything for Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada could tell everything about this preparation without being told anything by her. And that also trained her in being better and better as a cook because Srila Prabhupada always just wanted the best. Another service that she's very famous for is her beautiful singing, her angelic voice. We all know her from the Govindam track that's played at the greetings of all the deities all over the world. Um, and the story behind that is that they had um, Yamuna Devi and the six devotees in London had recorded an album with George Harrison um, once they started a temple there. And Srila Prabhupada wanted to hear the track, but some devotees felt like, it's a woman singing, so maybe Srila Prabhupada shouldn't hear this track. So they, they were saying, no, but we can't play it, and there's nothing to play it on, and Srila Prabhupada said, just use the sound system. And it was a few minutes before the deities were meant to be greeted, you know, the doors were meant to open. So they started playing it, and as soon as Srila Prabhupada heard it, his, his eyes just filled with tears, and tears just poured from his eyes because of the purity in Yamuna Devi's voice. And that's when he ordered that this track should be played to greet the deities all over the world. For us, greetings is defined by the song. We only know greetings to be Govindam playing. We don't, I can't imagine what it was like before the track came out to greet the deities. Um, that's how significant the song is. And it was her purity that attracted Srila Prabhupada. Um, George Harrison actually wanted to make her a celebrity because of her voice and he could see her talent, but she, re she declined. She wanted to only use all of her skills and all of her talents for the service of Krishna. We also know that she's expert in deity worship. Um, Yamuna Devi is meticulous in every service and because of this, Srila Prabhupada ordered her to learn deity worship from the temples in India, particularly the Radha Raman temple and um, other temples in India because he wanted to establish a temple in Vrindavan and, and she was meant to lead the deity worship and therefore he wanted the standards to be the highest class. So Yamuna Devi was the first Western woman to even live in Vrindavan. Then she was the first Western woman to be allowed into all of these temples and deity kitchens and um, all of these pujari departments for, for these temples in India. And she made extensive notes, which actually became her book, uh, The Study of Seva Puja, which just recently came out. I really want to get my hands on that. Um, so she made extensive notes and, and she, she also was instrumental in acquiring the deities that we worship in Vrindavan now, Radha Sham Sundar, and 
um, she actually went to, to get the moles to see the, the small deities, and she was not happy with any of them. She went back and forth so many times, and eventually she was happy with two. So one set is worshipped as Radha Sham Sundar, the Utsav deities in Vrindavan, and one set is her person, became her personal deities, who she lovingly named Radha Pan Bihari. Um, and there's some memories from London. So in London, because they were only six of them initially that opened up the temple. It was very small, and then as people started coming in, she was the only um, Brahmin-initiated Pujari there. So her memories from, in her memories from London, she says, as I was initially the only Gayatri-initiated Pujari, I performed all the offerings and artis. All of the new Brahmacharinis and I stayed in a tiny room, and we slept very little. They were such wonderful company. In fact, the whole family of devotees was exceptional. We all had so much affection and appreciation for each other, as well as a genuine desire to serve. It was a happy time. We felt empowered by Srila Prabhupada that we could do anything. That was the mood. And she was impeccably clean also. Srila Prabhupada had taught her the standards of cleanliness and deity worship, and she had a five-step program of cleaning Srila Prabhupada's rooms. She didn't see the difference between the Guru and Krishna, so she maintained the same standards that she would when worshipping the deity and cleaning the altar as she did in Shila, cleaning Srila Prabhupada's rooms, because she had that understanding that they're equal. And Srila Prabhupada gave her a lot of responsibility. Um, in Radhanath Swami's memories of the early days in Vrindavan, Prabhupada lived in Vrindavan for so many years and wanted to bring the whole world to Vrindavan. And he entrusted that responsibility on Gurudas and Yamuna to establish the temple in Vrindavan, establish the deity worship, and to renovate his rooms at Radha Damodar temple. Because he expected that the whole world would come visit there. And Radhanath Swami remembers that all he heard Yamuna Devi and her husband Gurudas speak about is what will please Srila Prabhupada? Will Srila Prabhupada be pleased by this? What does Srila Prabhupada want? They had this one pointed attention on, Sh on Srila Prabhupada's pleasure and his, um, and his desire. It was not at all about what was comfortable or convenient for them, everything was about what he wanted. Her level of surrender was unmatched. Um, there was one time that they were traveling by train with Srila Prabhupada, and he stopped in New Delhi, and a gentleman came over, and there was a 20-minute stop on the train. And a gentleman came over and told him, we want to start a temple, or he showed some interest in Krishna consciousness. And Srila Prabhupada just told Yamuna and Gurudas, okay, get off the train and just start the, the temple here. And they just did it. Like, they were completely surrendered. I was thinking of what would we do now if such a request came to us. But they were fully surrendered. There was nothing that she couldn't do for Srila Prabhupada. And there's nothing that she wouldn't do for him. Um, in terms of her art, she was also very artistic. Um, this is a pastime I found very interesting and very uh, deep. So Srila Prabhupada gave her the responsibility of renovating his rooms at Radha Damodar temple in Vrindavan. And Shri Shri Radha Radha Nath ki jai, Shri Shri Tanya Mahaprabhu ki jai, Shri Giri Govadhan ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. So Srila Prabhupada gave them the responsibility of renovating his rooms in Radha Damodar temple in Vrindavan. And it was very important because he says he eternally resides in those rooms. That is the hub of the wheel of the spiritual world, Radha Damodar Temple. So she took it as very seriously. And she wrote um, a, a memory of how she went about um, renovating his rooms. When I first came to Radha Damodar Mandir, I was very much immersed in trying to study the nectar of devotion because we were in the place of Rupa Goswami's Samadhi. From our roof upstairs, we could look down and see the Samadhi and Bhajan Kutir of Ra Rupa Goswami. So, I had read in the Nectar of Devotion a description of Stai Bhav, 12 kinds of transcendental humors which are controlled by different incarnations of God, Kapila, Madhava, Upendra, 
Nishinga, Nanda Nandana, Kurma, Kalki, Raghava, Balaram, Varaha, Bhargava, and Matsya. So Jiva Goswami informs us that in this Tai Bhav, there are different colors which represent these various incarnations. And she quotes from Nectar of Devotion, Chapter 34. Devotional service can therefore be divided into 12 types, each of which has a different color. The colors are white, multicolored, orange, red, light green, gray, yellow, off-whitish, smoky, pink, black, and cloudy. The 12 different kinds of transcendental humors are controlled by different incarnations of God, such as Kapila, Madhava, Upendra, Nishinga, Nanda Nandana, Balaram, Kurma, Kalki, Raghava, Bhargava, Varaha, and Matsya. And she continues, So I found out the colors. I asked Dr. Obial Kapoor what the colors were that matched these incarnations. And that is how I came up with the color scheme for Prabhupada's rooms in Radha Damodar. So the lower portion of the room was a nice reddish sandstone color. This yellowish white or ekru color, this is represented by Balaram. So the bottom here was the reddish floor, then this lovely ekru color. And then about 18 inches down from the ceiling, I painted the color of friendship, which was a reddish brown color that kind of echoed the color of the sandstone. And that is represented by Upendra. So just at the time when I came to paint this, one lady came from England, and her name was Ganga Mai Devi Dasi. She was a lovely, cheerful person, so anxious to help me, and I was grateful that Krishna had sent her to help me. So the two of us did all the painting. Then above that, in the mood of parenthood, was a rather deep red color, and that was the Sanskrit Mahamantra, not in English, and with bold letters. So I was a calligrapher, and we did a stencil of the Maha Mantra going around the room, a little bit down from the ceiling. Then there was a repeated line of this reddish brown color. So that is what was here in this room, and the same theme was repeated in the kitchen. So even something as renovation was so deep and meaningful. She didn't just renovate the room according to what would look nice or her desire. She went according to the Shastra and something that's meaningful, representing the 12 relationships that one can have with Krishna and the different colors. And it involves so much research just to renovate Srila Prabhupada's room, but everything was a meditation. Mukunda Maharaj remembers that um, Yamuna studied calligraphy at Reed College from Lloyd Reynolds. And Mukunda Maharaj also went to the same college, which was in Portland, Oregon. And he says, Yamuna was very expert at calligraphy. One of the things she did, among a number of things, was to cal calligraph the first Bhakti Shastri examination certificates. So in London in 1969, Srila Prabhupada gave them all the first Bhakti Shastri exam, which was 10 essay questions. Oh, you can find those on Veda Base. Um, and they all... Mukunda Maharaj says they all passed the exam, so they all were very happy to receive these beautiful certificates. Um, she, cal she calligraphed very ornate certificates. Each certificate had a golden seal, three centimeters in diameter, and two silver ribbons hanging down from it. And she also used her calligraphy skills to draw up contracts for the rooms at Radha Damodar Temple when they couldn't use the typewriter because there was no electricity in India. So she is someone who used every skill that she had in the service of Krishna. Yamuna Devi was also very austere. Um, not in the sense of just being forcefully austere. She was austere because of her love for Srila Prabhupada and Krishna. Her love drove her to be able to withstand all kinds of austerities because of, her, uh, because of the service she wanted to render. So she remembers, she has a prayer to Srila Prabhupada. <clears throat> I remember at the Arda Kumbha Mela in Allahabad when some of your disciples felt it was too difficult to rise early, take bath and attend the morning program with you. Seeing this, you encouraged us by personally going outside in the dark of night at 3 a.m. to bathe in unheated water and in near freezing weather, despite your age and dwindling health. Then, wrapped head to toe in wool, 
you sat with us outside in the wet pre-dawn cold for a full three-hour morning program without fail. In this connection, I pray that this vision of you always remain framed in my heart to give me strength against austerities. So that was in Kumbh Mela. It was always very austere there with the cold and bathing in freezing water. And in Vrindavan, when she was living there, it was the opposite. It was intense heat. Um, it was 125 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 52 degrees Celsius. So Yamuna Devi used to bucket bath in her room. So at Radha Damodar temple, she just had a small room for herself. And she was the only woman there, so she stayed alone. And in India, all the rooms have a slight slope and a drain just in the room. So, so the idea is that you can just wash yourself, wash anything, wash the floor, and just swoosh the water into the drain. So she did that, and she was bathing in this room from a bucket. And then, but in the heat, all she could do was just wet a cloth and just lay it over her when she slept. And, that's, and then trying to sleep, she would pray. If she couldn't fall asleep, she would pray, please let me not be affected by the heat. And in 10 minutes, that cloth would be dry. So she'd have to wake up, put it in water again, and put the cloth over her again. And she said in this way, that's how she managed to get five or six hours of sleep but all constantly being interrupted. And that's how intense the heat was, that she couldn't even sleep. Um, and she used to wake up at 1.30 a.m. in a lot of um, the places in India. She used to wake up at 1.30 so that she could be with Srila Prabhupada in the morning hours and chant Japa while he translates uh, his work because the rest of the day she's so busy with service. So all of these austerities she did out of love and uh, out of desire to be close to Srila Prabhupada. And there were no electricity. There was no electricity in Radha Damodar and no fans. Srila Prabhupada told her, Yamuna, in Vrindavan you must become fireproof. Sometimes the heat is unbearable there. You have already lived in London and become waterproof. So much rain is there. You must become both fireproof and waterproof. Then you can live anywhere and not be bothered. So... And she did. She did that. She did exactly what Srila Prabhupada wanted. Um, at Guru Das's, her husband Sanyas initiation, Srila Prabhupada said, his wife is also a great devotee. You know Yamuna. So now Yamuna has taken a very nice path. She has also become sannyasini. Although there is no sannyasini for women, but she has voluntarily taken. She is doing very nice. Therefore, I advised her husband that you also take sannyas. Because wife's affection is very, very tight knot. And later when Srila Prabhupada spoke to George Harrison, he said, referring to Yamuna, he said, his wife is also sannyasi, renounced. Have you seen her lately? She has cut hair and white dress, living alone in the temple. Vairagya Vidya Nija Bhakti Yoga. This Bhakti Yoga means Vairagya Vidya, means detachment. That is the perfection of life. If we remain attached, that is conditional. Maya has made so many things attractive so that we have to remain attached. And to come out of this attachment is called bhakti. It is very special. It's a very unique situation that Yamuna Devi accepted. Um, she also had a very, very sweet relationship with Srila Prabhupada that we, we know of because we've heard little memories here and there. Um, one pastime I found very, very sweet was when she was sick from exerting herself so much in service that she was lying in a passageway and in the, in the lady's ashram and Srila Prabhupada came to look for her. And when he saw her, she offered her obeisances and she said, I'm always thinking of you. And he said, and I am always thinking of you. And, and then he said, this place is not right for you to to recover in this is you need a better facility and then he went and made an arrangement for her to have a better facility to recover because he reciprocated with her devotion Yamuna Devi was always very close to Srila Prabhupada like physically and spiritually because she made no distinction between <laughs> because she made no distinction between men and women she she always felt like there was nothing, nothing that could stop her from serving Srila Prabhupada. She was always very close, walked very close to him, sat right in front. And, <clears throat> um, and then 
at one time in Allahabad, the, of course, the standards in India are very different. So she, uh, Sanyasi told her that basically she couldn't sit in the front. She should sit in the back where all the other ladies were sitting. So she sat, she did that the next time. And then Srila Prabhupada asked her, what happened? Do you not want to hear from me anymore? And she burst into tears because she loved hearing from Srila Prabhupada. Um, and she told him what had happened with the sannyasi. And then he said, yes, that is the etiquette. And Yamuna recalls at that moment, I paused, already lamenting and feeling his separation. Somehow knowing that this physical intimacy I had freely shared would now have to be curtailed in India. So I spontaneously said, Srila Prabhupada, how many times were you with your Guru Maharaj? Without a pause, he said, since I met him, I have never been away from him, not for one second. But I was not satisfied and wanted more. So I said with some force, but how many times were you actually with him physically? Srila Prabhupada said, very few, maybe five or six times. But they were intimate to me. He used to walk and talk with me, so many intimate things. Then he said, Many of my godbrothers were big sannyasis and thought that associating with the spiritual master personally was most important. But in some cases, they were no better than mosquitoes on the lap of a king. And what is the business of a mosquito? It is simply to suck blood. So don't think that the only way to associate with the spiritual master is by his physical association. You try to hear. For me, this was a monumental, life-changing moment. Up until then, I couldn't conceive of being separated from Prabhupada. Neither could I bear the thought that he would ever leave us. But I realized from this exchange, from this experience, that there would be a point in the future when we would be physically separated from him. And I would have to learn to feel his presence through his vani, his instructions and his examples. And then, looking at me with great feeling and love, he said, I am giving these lectures because you want to hear them so much. That person who is most favored by the spiritual master is one who follows his instructions. So do not think that you are being separated from me. And again, the flood of tears came. So I could tell as early as January 1971 that from then on there was to be a seeming distance from the prior intimacy I had in Srila Prabhupada's personal association. And I was prepared for it. I knew that it was des destined to come. And Srila Prabhupada had explained many times that in the early stages of association, the spiritual master is like a father. But he said that when the son matures, it is then the duty of the son to take care of the father. The father no longer has to spoon feed the son. So in this way, the maturing process, so, so this was the maturing process in understanding my responsibility to my spiritual master. And it began in this very small way on this very special day. It's such a nice lesson that Yamuna Devi took in a very, from a very small, subtle incident that happened. Um, we all have to come to this realization. But sometimes we might need bigger signs than, than this one that Yamuna Devi took um, so gracefully. And another inspiring point about Yamuna Devi's life is that she w she had to withstand many challenges. It's not, um, I guess before reading about her, I thought maybe it was always just, she was always close to Prabhupada and everything was so nice and everyone loved her. And like, it, it just painted a very happy, beautiful picture. But Yamuna Devi went through a lot of the same challenges that we go through. Um, and not just the challenges of starting a temple in a new place and the difficult austerities, but the challenges of difficult interactions with devotees, devotees not liking her or d just difficulties in that way. And um, a lot of difficulty came from the lack of female association, um, that she was always the only woman and there were so many men around. And um, also the, the Indian standards for women being imposed on her when she was from the West and didn't really identify with the culture in India. And I mean, she was the only Western woman living in Radha Damodar temple. So, so she had the challenges, but she took them in a very mature Krishna conscious way. She didn't let the challenges 
ruin her spiritual advancement in any way. She understood the, di the difference between bhakti and misapplication of bhakti. And she wasn't going to let anything um, stop her progress. She had a prayer to Srila Prabhupada that said, O oh, most revered spiritual master, wherever you take me by your desire, let me learn tolerance, acceptance, and humility. My constant and urgent prayer is that I may be of service to your servants and that I may somehow grow from the challenges on the path of devotional service. This is my fervent hope and heartfelt wish. So every challenge for her was, she took it as a sign from Krishna to grow. And she always asked, what does Krishna want from me? And what does Srila Prabhupada want me to learn in this situation? Um, she... She was revolutionary in her, in her mindset. All these challenges brought out things that she wants to change. Um, so to give a space to the Vaishnavis, she actually started an ashram for all the Vaishnavis in Oregon, which Prabhupada wasn't initially in favor of, but he encouraged it because in his mind, Prabhupada thought that women shouldn't live independently. But he understood that um, there would be women that need a space to practice Krishna consciousness and they would be frustrated um, without having a home or husband or anything. So he, he said that they, they can have that and the engagement should be chanting, reading the philosophy and worshipping the deity. And he gave them the instruction to keep aloof from men, that this is their space and um, they should just serve, just give their whole life to Krishna. And they wanted to do cow protection, mass cow protection. But he said, maybe just keep a few cows, because if you have big scale cow protection, then you'll need to take help from men. So he was very protective over this project. And I thought that was very revolutionary for the time, and also the fact that Prabhupada allowed the space to be there. Um, she also, Yamuna Devi also took, took a lot of care of the youth. She understood the importance of the youth in our movement and the importance of investing in them, inspiring them, and sharing nectar about Srila Prabhupada. Um, Yamuna Devi perfectly understood Vani and Vapu. She had the same intensity in serving Srila Prabhupada in separation than she that she did when he was physically present. And there was no change in her mood. She wrote, I worship everything of my guru, but that is my responsibility as a disciple. There isn't anything that I don't worship about my guru. When you take a guru, you will have to find a place in your mind to do that by looking at the manifested qualities, not the name. It isn't the name Bhaktivedanta Swami. It is everything about him. It is his character. It is his essence. It is his Krishna consciousness that we worship as a disciple. And she's got really beautiful prayers to Srila Prabhupada. I pray that one day in the future, I may see you face to face again. This vision may be many lifetimes in front of me, but I do not see any other goal worth achieving, however slow or difficult or impossible this task may seem from my fallen position. There is nothing else more appealing. Please bless me with the perseverance to continue on the path to meet you. Another prayer. I am but a small spark in the great conflagration of Harinam Sankirtan under, under the direction of Srila Prabhupada. Yet I feel fulfilled, encouraged and nourished. Wherever Srila Prabhupada takes me on the next leg of the tour, or wherever he drops me off into unknown destinations, I have full faith in his protection. Though I lack full surrender, as I lament when I am away from his association. My dear Lord, I feel the only cure for my disease is if you give me the ability to feel the presence of Srila Prabhupada at all times in all places. It is asking a lot and I am unworthy, yet I brazenly pray for such a gift. Please forgive me. So that was her understanding of Vani and Vapu coming through in these prayers. And Everyone who knows her and knew her personally said that she lived every day as if Prabhupada was with her because she never felt separated from him. Um, I'll end with a prayer that she wrote which became, uh, which got translated into Bengali. It's a 
I think it's like now a Bengali bhajan, but it, so she wrote the English. So I'm just going to read the English. Thousands, millions of souls are wandering this world for millions of births. Some fortunate ones attain the treasure of devotion, which is like a beautiful blooming vine by the mercy of Guru and Krishna. O my eternal spiritual master, I beg this mercy. May I be in constant remembrance of the dawning of love for the divine couple's lotus feet. Singing their names, glories, pastimes, and glorifying their devotees, may I forget this world. I beg the mercy of attaining your feet. I pray to sit in the groves of Braja, hearing and chanting, singing the Maha Mantra in great love. By your mercy, the seed of the Bhakti Lata will then sprout. Hypocrisy, envy, lust, anger, greed, and the false ego, the false devotee ego. By Nam Sankirtan, may I sever and discard all these weeds of Maya. Then, in Vrindavan, in the glow of beloved Radha Damodar's beauty, I will catch that wistful glance, and my heart will be consumed with all joy. O oh, my spiritual master, you are truly a pure devotee. Mercifully, you gave us the secrets of Radha's service to Krishna. In Sridham Navadvip, may I drink of the flood of devotion. Giving up arrogance and ignorance, I will sing of your place in my heart forever. So that's a nice prayer for all of us to meditate on. Um, that was written by Yamuna Devi. And I'll end here. And I actually want to ask if anyone has any contributions, because I know so many devotees here would have read about Yamuna Devi and would maybe want to share a pastime that struck them. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Sarabi, for bringing us into the mood and service of Yamuna Devi. It was really inspiring to hear. Um, I remember when reading her book also, that it was a little sad sometimes to see, you know, how, how, how many challenges she had. Uh, but really seeing how wonderfully she, you know, she overcome those, overcame those challenges and how Krishna conscious she was. I mean, the thing that really touched me was how she was so sold out to Prabhupada. And we find that with many of Prabhupada's disciples, but she was exceptional also. She was just totally sold out to Prabhupada. And uh, she had no other desire to do anything. And that really, really touched us. And being such an early disciple of Prabhupada, she just, uh, when she was told these things by sannyasis who came much later than her, right? You know, those sannyasis definitely joined much after her. So she was much more senior than her. But still, she kind of accepted it and she didn't make a fuss about it. It's quite amazing because those early devotees of Prabhupada had such close association with him. And as the movement changed and evolved and they were, had to play different roles, they just kind of accepted it, which was very amazing. They didn't kind of fight for their position again. They understood mm -hmm. what was happening and this shows how surrendered they were. But really, she was such an exceptional devotee. Uh, and I was wondering if you remembered how long she took to create that cookbook. Do you remember anything about that? Okay. I don't know, actually. I didn't come across that in my very brief research <laughs> that I did. Um, I think no. it took like over a few decades from wow. what I remember. She started yeah. working over many decades. I can't remember how long, but it was decades of service to create that book that we now have. But I don't remember the exact number. I, I, I remember reading that she asked Prabhupada for blessings to create this cookbook. But I'm thinking if the cookbook did, the cookbook did come out much later, so it would have taken all that time. So, yeah. Uh, I think we know that the cookbook has many hundreds of recipes. Mm. She tried each one out, tested and refined the recipe to do it. So it took her many years of, of her life to do that. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Is there anyone else that has a memory or pastime?
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Surabhi Kun. That was a beautiful class, well researched. I admire you for that. Uh, something struck me a lot of Yamuna Devi. I once, I probably am not sure whether I read it or I heard it in a lecture or something, and it struck me right up until this day. Um, she was very attached to Prabhupada, like we all knew, and everything of Prabhupada was like a gem to her. I think on one of Prabhupada's wa morning walk, uh, as they were walking, and I think there was a stone in Prabhupada's shoes accidentally. So he was finding it difficult to walk, and then he stopped to get the stone off his shoe. And she knelt down, and he, he held his shoulder, he took off that shoe, uh, took out stone from the shoe. And somehow secretly she kept that piece of stone so safe. I wonder if we could do something like that. Um, it's just a thought that got me, and I was just thinking of that, that little thing when you were discussing uh, Yamuna Devi's life. Thank you so much. Wow, thanks for sharing that pastime. Yeah. Anyone else? We can. Anyone else would like to share something about Yamuna Devi, whose class that has been presented today? Okay, so thank you very much to Ravi Kunj for enlightening us on Yamuna Devi and also Srila Prabhupada's favorite daughter actually because that's how Srila Prabhupada saw his disciples as sons and daughters and you can see that Yamuna Devi was obviously one of his favorite daughters.